When I was growing up, Nickelodeon had the greatest shows. I grew up in an era of a show called Salute Your Shorts, which was all about summer camp. Hey Dude, which was all about teenagers who worked at a ranch. And right as I was, right as I was in, that, in that age and in that vibe of just some of the greatest shows outside of Saved by the Bell that television had to offer, <laughs> they started a new Saturday night thing called SNCC. And one of the shows was called, Are You Afraid of the Dark? And to which I would have answered, no, I'm not afraid of the dark. And then I watched part of the first episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark? And then I became afraid of the dark. <laughs> and looking back, I'm sure it was ridiculous, but I had never, my little sheltered self had never seen anything like that. And so I watched part of the first one and then turned it off. And it was right around this time that, that we got the book club book orders and I ordered Goosebumps by R.L. Stein. And then shortly after that, it was one night and I couldn't sleep. And all of a sudden, I heard tapping on my wall. Shot out of bed and looked around. Couldn't figure it out. My sister's room was on the other side, so there was no way she would be tapping on the wall that my bed was on. So I went out, and my room acted like I needed a drink of water. Nobody was there. I didn't hear any more tapping. I got back into my room. I closed the door. The tapping started again. I did what any logical kid would do. I got in bed under the covers. Because when you're in bed <laughs> under the covers, you are bulletproof. Nothing can get you under the covers. Now, if your arm hangs off the bed or if your feet are off the bed, fair game for whatever's <laughs> under the bed, right? But as long as you're on the bed under the covers, you're cool. I kept hearing this tapping. I couldn't figure it out. And every time, I, every time it would stop and I would drift off to, to sleep, as soon as I would drift off to sleep, it would start again all night long. And I was freaking out. But I was beyond the age where you could call your parents in the room and it was okay to freak out. And so it was just one of those times where this is just... This is just the entrance to manhood, I told myself, and you're just going to have to be brave. I did not sleep at all that night, and I was so scared of what was tapping on the wall. I woke up the next morning, and I heard the tapping. But with a newfound bravery, with my parents awake and, and all the light on, I said, I'm going to figure this out. You know what kept me up all night long, scared to death? A stupid Christmas wreath hanging on our front door from the wind blowing the wreath that would blow and hit the door. I was scared all night of a wreath. <laughs> like That's hard for me to admit to you here 20-some years late, 30-some years later, that I was scared of a wreath. A wreath is what kept me up all night. The question I have for you this morning is not, are you afraid of the dark? Because we understand that this is, this is something that a lot, of, a lot of kids especially struggle with. So there's night lights and security blankets and, and rubber sheets for, for if they can't control their emotions when they're scared of the dark and all, all, all those things. But today the question I have for you is this, are you afraid of the light? Are you afraid of the light? Today, as we continue our look at 1 Corinthians, we're going to arrive at 1 Corinthians 4. So if you have your phones or your Bible apps, you can follow along there. And today we're going to talk about something that nobody really wants to talk about. But we're going to talk about the judgment of God. We're going to talk about the judgment of God. Now here's what's fascinating to me. In the age in which we live, where everybody says, nobody can judge me. And in the age in which we live, where, where this idea of judgment is, is increasingly unpopular, there's also an increased thirst and an increased interest for justice. We see this on display all the time. We've, we've seen it this week. No matter what side of the impeachment trial you may find yourself on, you are screaming for justice, either for, for the president to be found guilty or for the president to be acquitted. Whatever side you find yourself on, you are sure that you are seeking a quest of, judge, of justice. We see it in the marchers for the unborn. We see it in the climate activists and their desire to clean up the environment. 
We see it in the Me Too movement. We see all these causes that people are passionate about. And what's interesting is many of these causes divide people along ideological lines. And yet, the one thing that all of them have in common is a desire for justice. And the reality is this. You cannot have justice without judgment. You cannot have justice without judgment. And so while we find ourselves in a culture that is increasingly opposed to judgment, there is a deep thirst and a deep desire for justice. And where does that leave us? And what does that mean for us, for those of us who follow Jesus and the implications that this has, not just in our lives, but in our relationships with God. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. So we're going to start in 1 Corinthians 4.1, where we read these words. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. And again, Paul drives the point home that we've talked about in the last few weeks. And if you missed any of those, they're available on online. You can go to our webpage, lakeside-church.com. You can go directly to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Lakeside Algoma. Or you can search Lakeside Algoma in the Apple Podcasts or Spotify Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts, and you can follow along there. But again, we see the Apostle Paul driving home the point that he's driven home already that those who run to ch- who those who run the church are to set the tone in serving those who run the church are to set the tone in serving and so my commitment to you is simply this that the staff of lakeside will never ask the church to do something that we are not willing to do we will never ask you to do something we aren't willing to do and something we ourselves are not doing as as people who have the privilege of serving here at lakeside we will set the tone in how we serve That is my commitment to you, and we will never ask you to do anything that we ourselves are not doing. And if we get to the point where we are not being servants and we are not fulfilling all the obligations that we have pledged to do and that we are asking you to do, it's time for us to go, and we will be moved on. That is my commitment to you, that as we as a staff at Lakeside, we will set the tone, and we will set the example, and we will never ask you to do something that we are not willing to do. We have, we have a covenant that people sign when they come on staff that basically lays this out because we are not going to be hypocrites. We've seen how Jesus responds to hypocrisy, and he despises it. And so we will set the tone. We will set the tone in service. We will set the tone in generosity. We will set the tone in love. That is my commitment to you for those of us who, who have the privilege of serving here at Lakeside. We will set the tone, and we will never ask you to do something that we ourselves are not committed to doing. A basic, jobs, a basic job of workers is to be faithful. It's to be faithful to their boss, to show up, to show up to work, to show up to work on time, to actually put in the work while you're at work, and to live up to the expectations they agreed to when accepting the job. And what's crazy about this is if you would just do that in today's marketplace, if you would just do that, you will set yourself apart as a worker. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. Here's this idea that that Paul says, this is just a basic idea of what it means to serve somebody. And yet, if you would just put in these basic things in your life, put them into practice in your workplace, you will set yourself apart. That you show up when you're supposed to show up, that you show up on time, that you put in the work while you're at work, and that you live up to the expectations that you agreed to when you accepted the job. And so if you want to set yourself apart in, in a work environment, Start there. Start there. But then he takes a different turn. And he says this. So look at me like a servant. Understand that I'm just a servant putting in the work that I'm supposed to put in. But with me, it is very, a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. And so here he just says, I don't care all that much. I don't care all that much if you judge me. It's not a huge deal to me if you judge me. That's not this this big deal. What's fascinating to me is how many people become paralyzed in life because of other people's perceptions of them. Because somebody else 
feels this way, and oh, I heard somebody else thinks this about me. They become paralyzed, and, and they just, they're worried about being, they're worried about offending somebody, or they're worried that somebody else has these thoughts or these feelings about them. And so rather than be themselves and be who God has created them to be, they just stop, and they try this quest of not offending anyone. All because they're worried about the perception of others. Here's the reality about the perception of others. There are going to be a lot of people who like you. There are going to be a lot of people who don't like you. And there are going to be even more people who really don't care about you. It's just the reality of life. And if you spend all of your time worried about the people who, for whatever reason, have a negative connotation about you, you will never be able to live up to the potential that God has created you with. Now, this doesn't mean you have a license to be a jerk to everybody and be like, well, I don't really... No, 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 no. Conduct your life in a way that brings honor and glory to Jesus, and that's what we're going to talk about in a few minutes. But understand this. You cannot allow yourself to become paralyzed because of other people's perceptions about you. Some people are in a prison, a self-imposed prison, all because they're constantly worried about what somebody else is going to say about them, what somebody else is going to feel about them. And for you, you just need to understand and adopt this mindset that your worth and your value is not derived in what other people's perception of you is. I just want to ask, are you stuck? Have you allowed what somebody else thinks about you to to hold you back? Understand that you need to find your significance, not in your popularity. And this is where you need to end up. That you get to the point where you say, At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter all that much to me what you think about me. Because there are going to be be people who love you, there are going to be people who hate you, and there are going to be a lot of people who just simply don't care. And it's not that they're mean or anything else, it's just they have other things to worry about. You don't come to their mind. And that's okay. And then he says, in fact, I I don't even judge myself For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Not aware of of any red, huge red flags in his life. Not aware of any habitual problem that's on display. He says, I'm not aware of anything against myself, but that doesn't mean I'm innocent. It doesn't mean that I'm okay just because I'm not aware. Because, understand this, the most dangerous deception is self-deception. The most dangerous deception is self-deception. And so Paul understands that. And what he says is, I don't know of anything that's going wrong in my life right now that I can point at and say, this isn't where it needs to be, but that's not really my job. That's God's job. And God can, peer, God can peel back the layers that, that I have put up in my life where I've told myself everything's okay. And he can peel back those layers and reveal to me the things that I didn't even understand were a problem. You ever had that moment where all of a sudden God reveals something to you and you're like, well, I've gotten that wrong for 30 years. <laughs> Guess I have some work to do. And where we once thought we were fine, God goes to work. And so he says, I'm not going to have this false sense of security. I'm not going to have this false sense that everything in my life is cool and okay. I've got to peel back the layers, but, but understand that I can only peel them back so far. And then that's a work of God. And God knows my motives. God knows all of the things that I've convinced myself are okay that aren't really okay. And that's the work of God. It's the Lord who judges me. And then he continues in verse 5. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purpose of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Bring to light those things hidden in the dark. 
He reveals our true motives. He shines a light into those dark areas of our soul, the things that we regret, the things we think that no, nobody knows about, the things we think that we've gotten away with, the secrets that we keep, all of those things. Paul says God brings all of that to light. And it reveals our true motives. And that's why I ask, are we afraid of the light? Are we afraid of the light? We conduct our lives in such a way that if the light was to be, to be shown that, oh, the facade would crumble. The lies that we've carried about that nobody knows. The weight that we have, that we have kept inside that, that holds us down, but that we're able to somehow struggle just enough to carry without it all exploding all over the place for everyone to see will ultimately be revealed. Are we afraid of the light? What in our life right now that if a light was if a light was shown upon it, that we say, I need to fix that? Or what is happening in our lives right now that if everybody discovered it would ruin our reputation and break the trust of those closest to us? I want to challenge you this, to live your life in such a way that this is an exciting thought and not a terrifying one. Live your life in such a way that this is an exciting thought and, and not a terrifying one. You're like, well, how, how do I do that? Well, start, start with this. This week, do something good for someone without them ever figuring out who it was from. Do something in secret that encourages or benefits somebody that somebody will never figure out it was from you. Just do good in a way that, that is it's not about the praise. It's not about the post on social media. It, it's not about letting everybody know so they tell you how awesome. But you just do something that benefits somebody's life in a way they'll never discover who it was. But understand that there will be a light shown on everything. And the challenge for us who, who follow Jesus is to live our lives in such a way that this is a thought that is exciting to us and not one that brings about fear and trembling. Later in the chapter, he contrasts the rewards of God with his present circumstances. So we're going to pick it up there in, in verse 11 where we read these words. To the present hour we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor working with our own hands. When reviled we bless. When persecuted we endure. When slandered we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world. The refuse of all things. Understand that following Jesus is no guarantee that things will be great. In fact, it's just the opposite. Jesus told his followers, you're going to have a lot of problems. I have. Why do you think it would be any different for you? Following Jesus is not a promise that everything is going to be great, that every wish you ever have will be granted, and life will become a fairy tale. And as followers of Jesus, we understand that the lives in which we live will oftentimes be difficult, that people will oppose us, that people will say things that are not true, that we will face trouble and hardship of many kinds. But as followers of Jesus, we must simply be better. We must simply be better. And when our critics cry out against us, and they will, and when our critics cry out against us even louder, we choose love. 
We don't fire back. We don't respond insult for insult. We don't try to win the argument. We choose love. What's fascinating to me is this idea, and I'll read it again. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. Think about that. That we who follow Jesus will be reviled. We will be persecuted. We will be slandered. And our response is love. Can I just tell you, in the moment, that doesn't feel good always. In the moment, there's there's a big part of me that just, I want to fight. And I'm, I can be quick with a comeback. And so if you, if you want to go in a debate, let's go. No, 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 no. It's not about winning a debate. It's not about how everybody sees you. It's about living a life of love. And so some of the debates that we will probably lose as a result of this that could bother us a little bit, we must remember that one day there will be a light shown upon those moments. That those are not lost to history That God doesn't see them. But all the more. That he's watching. And we will answer. For how we respond. Always respond in love. You will face critics. You will face people who do not understand. And as followers of Jesus, our call is always to respond in love. And by the way, this is why it's so important that we don't find our value in the perception that others have of us. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. He says, this isn't about guilting you if your circumstances aren't as bad as mine. I'm not up here just just telling you that that you're, you're not doing something right because your life isn't as difficult as my life currently is. No, no, no. He says, circumstances could, could be different. but But rather, I write this to reveal to you how much I love you. Rather, I write this to you to reveal to you how much I love you, what it has cost me to serve you. If you're a manager, if you're a boss, if you're an owner of a company, if you're a team leader, listen. Listen. If you lead, you must love. If you lead... You must love. And for all of us, whether you're a leader in in some area or not, whether you have responsibilities or not, for all of us, here's the takeaway. That we can live in such a way that people can look at us and they should want to replicate our lives. That people can look at our lives and we live in such a way that people see us and they say, that is a life that is worthy of being replicated. Now, does this mean we're going to be perfect? Absolutely not. We're going to fall short. We're going to fail. And yet, 
It is something that should encourage us all the more to strive to become more and more like Jesus. That when people look at us, what they see is something that is just so contagious. What they look at us and they see is something that is so encouraging and so desirable that they say, I I may not even know what it is. I may not even know what they've got, but I want it. You know what I found in my life? Is most people don't do that when you win the debate. As good as it feels. They may laugh, they may chuckle, but all they generally see is, wow, somebody likes to argue. They don't do that when somebody gets on their high horse and tells everybody else what they should do. But they themselves aren't willing to model it. Live your life in such a way that people look to you and want to replicate your life. Paul says, I want you to be imitators of me. I want you to look at how I conduct myself in the way that I love you. I want you to look at me and to imitate me. Not because he's trying to build his own kingdom, but because he knows that if they imitate his life, they will be closer to Jesus. As followers of Jesus, are you living your life that way? Parents, you don't get any time off. Our kids are a mirror. And oftentimes, it's really convicting in what they show. Because you'll look at your kid and be like, where did you learn that? (laughs) Right? I know it's my kid's mom, but I mean, for most of you, (laughs) it's you. I love that Brooks and Littles half the time. (laughs) She knows. I'm kidding. You have employees? They're watching. It used to drive me crazy when, when a teacher or a parent or a friend's parent would say to us, do as I say, not as I do. What? Why? Model it with your life. And then we skip down to verse 20 where we read these words. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. The proof of God working is not in words, but it's in actions. And it's on display kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. And our prayer and our desire here at Lakeside is not just to float out some great ideas or some awesome concepts. Our desire is to get out of the way and let God go to work to see lives changed to see ministries launched to help people move closer to Jesus. This drives everything that we're about. And our desire is not to talk about an act or a movement of God, but to do all we can to see it at work here in Algoma and across our region. Let me ask you again. Are you afraid of the light? Are you afraid of the light? Because everything's going to come to light. So what does this mean? First, live in a way that this is an exciting concept to you. And not something you have to be fearful of. 
live in a way that this is an exciting concept to you and not something you have to be fearful of. Which means some of you right now need to delete a secret email account. Some of you need to send a message to somebody that we haven't crossed any lines, but we've gotten really close and we're done. Some of you need to stop cheating at things that nobody knows you're cheating. The IRS will never discover it, but in your heart, you know. It's not just clever accounting. It's deceit. Live in such a way that this is exciting. Do good for people and never let them find out it was you. Second, don't let the thoughts of other people paralyze you. God has too much that he wants to accomplish in you to allow the perception of other people to paralyze you. Just refuse to let it happen. Third, serve well. Love well. Serve well and love well. And lastly, ask God to work in you. That your life would be one worthy of being imitated. And that people could look to you and say, I want to live my life that way. And in the process, we point them to Jesus and see them become more like him. This is how we bring about the kingdom of God. Not that we just have to talk about it, but how we actually bring it about. And so right now, It's just going to be quiet for about 30 seconds to a minute. And I'm just going to encourage you in that time to just pray that God works in you and in Lakeside for us to see his kingdom on full display. Not in talk, but in a movement of God. And as we all unite our hearts to say, we want to start with us personally. And we want to work together as a church to see that happen. I fully believe God will do some incredible things. And then I'll pray. We'll sing some more songs. But let's live in such a way that we don't have to be scared of the light. God, help us be people who follow you well, whose lives can be looked to as an example and as encouragement. I pray, God, that with with a sense of somberness, we could understand that you see all. And and so, God, I pray right now for, for anyone in this room struggling with things they know they need to leave behind, and I pray, God, that they would just let go. And I know, God, it's not always that easy, and there can be some other things, but, God, I also know that you are greater than all of our circumstances, and you are greater than all of our struggles. And so, God, I pray right now that their hearts would be in tune with your Spirit,
And that we could say that this is exciting, that one day all of the things that are done in the dark will come to light. Help us love. Help us serve well. Help us love well. Help us stop finding our significance in what everybody thinks about us or what everybody says about us. God, do some awesome things through our lives and through Lakeside that just blow our minds. We ask in your son Jesus' name.